Hello, my name is Anad Baniel. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this overview DVD of the Anad Baniel Method for Children. In this DVD, you will see 15 different children with the different categories of disability. Each child we've edited down to two minutes with a, a voiceover by me. The work is done both by myself and by some of the practitioners I've trained. Today, there are roughly 200 Anad Baniel Method practitioners. Most of them are situated in the United States, but there are a few in Israel, in Egypt, in Singapore, and a few in Europe. I would like to take just a moment to tell you a little bit about the Anad Baniel Method for children. This method is scientifically based. It is primarily based in the understanding of what the brain requires in order to form new patterns and new configurations of action. So when we get a child with special needs, we do not try to cure the child. We are not a medical approach, but rather a learning-based approach. No matter what the condition of the child, we always look to see if we can find a way to communicate with that child and that child's brain to help it form new patterns that will help the child get past its own limitations. I have identified nine basic requirements, which I call the nine essentials, that when the brain is presented with those essentials, it gets the information it needs in order to begin forming patterns very quickly and very efficiently. And with children, it is done even faster than with adults. The first and most fundamental essential is what I call movement with attention. Movement helps the brain both grow and organize. And we do the work in such a way that the child notices what happens to it. Even an infant that is a day old begins paying attention to the sensations that they get through the movement. As you will see when you watch the children on this DVD, the changes happen sometimes so rapidly that it looks like almost miraculous or as if they didn't have the difficulty to begin with. With other children, the process is much longer, but in each and every session, we look for the child to acquire a few new patterns. That means for that brain to always be creating new possibilities that helps the child move into its future. So we are not very focused on the limitation, but we are focused on what the child can move to do. And over the 30 years of my work with thousands of children and the many practitioners now that do this work, we have discovered that over and over again, this approach basically absorbs a great degree of limitation and allows the children to have fuller and fuller lives and more successful lives. So now let's get to the actual children. This is Eli. He's five months old and was referred to us by Dr. Woodard, the pediatrician, who just diagnosed him with a, a cerebral palsy. His hands are most of the time in his mouth. He never rolled on his belly before. And here, very lightly, you see he already rolls on his belly. This is Marcy Lindheimer, an ABM for Children practitioner. Now look how the child listens to himself and feels, feels his own body, and there he will push himself in his own initiative. We do not impose on the child. We look for the child's brain to recognize what is going on and initiate their own movements. Eli had a severe scoliosis in his lower back uh, from birth. A few weeks after we started working with him, the spine got uh, straight. And look at his hands got very free. And he, here he initiates crawling on his own. His left side is still a little bit more spastic, but still he can manage movement with it very very well and here he's just happy which is nice to see we don't impose on the child here with a very light touch I helped him come on his hands and knees and I help him bend the left leg but when he straightens it I won't insist because we don't impose we look for the child to recognize what they're doing and to initiate movement like all healthy children do and look here that's an example of that
This is Tim. He was eight years old when I began working with him. We do not have video of the initial uh, lessons, but he couldn't even lie flat on the table. He was not able to talk. After the first two lessons, his back and chest and breathing improved so much that he began talking nonstop. And his mother, a veterinarian, jokingly asked if I can take it back. Here you see him. He has developed remarkable capacities and organization in the gravitational field. I'm actually instructing him what to do, and he's following it. Look here. He's sitting, and how beautifully, and he corrects the head when it uh, goes sideways. Here I'm giving him instructions to take his leg behind, and look how well he follows it. He couldn't even sit up when he was first brought to me, and obviously had a huge improvement. I, he's a very intelligent boy, so I give him lots of verbal instructions to enhance his awareness of his own body. In a minute, I'd let you listen in to a bit of the lesson and how I communicate with Tim. Go down to put your feet, look to find the floor, not wait for it to be first cool. That's it, excellent. Uh, uh, push up, push up with the belly forward, just like you did on your knees. That's right. And put your feet, look to find the floor. That's right. And push forward with your belly. Spread your leg, put both legs down. Spread it. That's it. And push the belly forward. This one too. Push. That's good. Now keep pushing. Keep pushing me. Fantastic. Now keep pushing me. Keep pushing me. Push me. Push me. Hey, both arms. Both arms. Push me. Hey, you forgot the arms. Hey. And now you me. can see how That's his it. lower push back me. is working so push much better. Me. Keep he pushing didn't me. even know he had a lower back. That's when it. Keep pushing. So all the therapy that was done with him really, to a great extent, did not do much. Look how quiet he's here. How much he can do, and in a minute you'll see what Tim can do now. You see, he simply knows how to stand up, and he walks on his own. Quite remarkable. Your very first lesson with us, right? Okay. Linda, Linda, Linda. Oh, Linda Wilson. Oh, great. Okay. What What I would do? Excellent. And now don't try to straighten it. Okay. I'm going to keep it just as it is. We're going to try and do a movement you're not used to doing, which is this and this. Excellent. Gradually, and then she can take the eyes, same direction, but tiny movement because you don't want this to lift off very much. And until this starts differentiating. Mm -hmm. okay. Dominique is uh, 14 years old, very intelligent girl, and I immediately realized that she had no idea about her lower back. Her brain never got connected to her lower back. She's never walked independently here after her first session with a trainee in the practicum. Look, she's feeling how to shift the weight and then how to apply her lower back so she can actually stand up on the leg. People watching this actually were crying because this girl never walked on her own and she can walk with a walker. And it was actually miraculous, the amount of change. Here she's walking in by herself without a walker for the first time in her life. After that one lesson from a trainee, who here is trying to get her to feel. That's her practitioner back in Arizona who is in there my go. training program. It's going to be very easy. There you go. And now, and now, and now. And now, slouch. Okay, uncross your legs. She can do it. Uncross your legs, sweetie. There you go. Push the belly out. And imagine you're on your feet. Now, you're pushing back the... Don't push against my hand. That's it. Throughout the first uh, 14 years where Dominic got therapy, the focus was on the muscles and on their spasticity, the legs. And what we did with her was really get her to feel what was going on and begin differentiating, creating new possibilities in her brain. And she responded with such speed that I believe had she gotten to us or gotten this kind of work and approach when she was three months old or six months old, she would be walking freely today. Here, just after th three sessions in class, mostly with the trainees, she has, for the first time in her life, the sense of what it means to be upright. It's not 100% there, but it's a huge improvement in hardly any time at all.
Yakim is a year old French boy with athetoid CP that Joseph saw for the first time. Uh, incredible limitations, but a very intelligent boy. His father is using some kind of reading device, uh, and Yakim is using his eyes. Here you can see that uh, he cannot lie quiet, his legs is obviously crossed, but like Tim was when he got to me first, he, he doesn't know how to respond to the gravitational field properly. So he has really no control at all, or hardly at all, of his movements. Lying on his stomach is almost unbearable for him. So here in my lesson, I've gradually done a, a work with him so that a, a lot of the chronic contractions uh, stop, the brain stop making those contractions. Now, Yakim never, especially in his stomach, turned his head to his left. And here, with by what I'm doing with his pelvis and helping his spine twist, he himself spontaneously turned his head to the left which was quite remarkable. The arms are still quite stiff, but it's a look at the movement now in his spine and chest and pelvis, which he had never, ever experienced in his life before. And if at age nine he can respond so quickly, imagine what he could have done when he was three months old or six months old or a year old if he had gotten this kind of work. It would have looked a lot more like Eli that uh, was able to crawl. And here he's following on his belly. He's could not lie on his belly. This is really very uncomfortable. And now watch how for seconds it'll, he'll go back, but he has a better feeling of how to uh, carry his head and look how free now the hand and the arm have become and how calm the child became. We have not stopped the recording yet. And look, he's just his thumb is moving a little bit and he feels himself in a whole new way. It's a calm brain. This is Kai. Uh, he's nine months old here. That's his first lesson with me. And he has uh, cerebral palsy and torticollis uh, dystonia. And uh, incredibly stiff anytime he tries to do anything. And the jaw gets very, very tight. I'm gently trying to feel what he can do and how he responds. And obviously the nervous system has a very powerful, rigid, compulsive pattern, which has the name of torticollis dystonia, and looking to see if he can start feeling a little more ease in the movement in his back, so he has more say in what's happening with his head and those violent spasms. Here he went into a spasm, it's painful, so he starts to cry, and I distract him, and that stops the spasm. Here, he's a year older, he got some lessons uh, in between. They live uh, far away in Northern Cali California. And this is Marcy again. And you can see with the, from the work with Sylvia Liner Shordike and a few other practitioners, whenever the mother can get him for lessons, she does. But look how the chest is free, how the child is calm. And probably I would like you to pay mostly attention now how he listens internally. That is when the learning is occurring. That is when the change is happening. And the children feel very comfortable. Now, Marcy very gradually is getting him to feel. In a minute, you'll see, feels until he's ready to bend his leg and then the other one. And he's cooperating with her. And then he, she gets him to push. And she's actually telling him to push himself. And you see the child. He's uh, delighted. Uh, he feels what he's doing. And... He doesn't get much spasm in the neck while he does it. And look at how calm and how beautifully he sits here and how happy he is. There's a long way to go, but the changes are quite remarkable. This is Isaac. He's six months old. This is after I've seen him for a few lessons. Uh, he had a meningitis at a month old that they believe he got at the hospital, and then they discovered a hydrocephalus at two and a half months old, and they put a shunt in his brain. You can see here he doesn't know how to roll over, and when he does, he doesn't know how to lift his head off. You can see that he, has, he had torticollis with the top of the head going over to his right, 
and couldn't roll over. When I saw him first, his hands were fisted all the time. Here, he starts opening them a little bit. He actually started opening them after the very first lesson. And look here, he is already able to roll on the belly and bring the head up. And Isaac was learning very fast, but the torticollis took a little while to um, clear. And as you can see, very quickly, Isaac began reaching out for objects, and but the hands are still spastic, the fingers are still spastic, and you can... Isaac was gone for two months because the shunt failed, so here I see him again after the surgery, and uh, you can see that it's easier for him to follow an object uh, uh, to one side, and I'm giving him time to try and reach over to the left, and then once it's established in his brain, it's more likely he will do it to the other side, which to the right, which is the less likely side for him to turn his head, and you can see he dropped it. I continue working with Isaac. Here's his uh, twin sister, and look that they're not that different from one another anymore in the way they roll over. So Isaac was starting to catch up. The mother was told not to expect him to do well, and look how his hands are more open, his ability to sit and move the head in space gets uh, very clear, the wrists are free, and here I'm doing some work on his lower back and he starts crawling, which he was starting to do uh, that week or the week before, but getting up is still very precarious. Again, the mother was told by the neurologist that he will never walk or he will have a bad posture and never walk well and be very spastic. And as you can see, everything I do is really trying to get Isaac's brain to recognize what he needs to do in order to execute his intentions. And here, it's much easier for him to get up. Really, every lesson, there was very, very clear progress. But here we're looking at Isaac a, a year later, so it didn't all happen in one day, but everything he learned to do, he did so well, and of course the boy is so intelligent, he's playing, he's not talking here yet, so that was another thing the mother was told, that he might never speak. So it was very traumatizing for her, because she kept hearing what he will not do. My contention all along was, since he can learn to do each single thing so well, he has a nervous system that's capable of organizing action in such exquisite quality, it's only a question of time. Here he walks independently for the very, very first time in his life at the end of a lesson. Most people, if they didn't know that anything was the matter with Isaac and didn't know his age, would think that he's a perfectly healthy, normal child, which he is. The only thing is, he took a little longer to develop given his traumas. Without this work, he could have very well ended up having the limitations or many of the limitations that he were, was predicted to have. Ma many were concerned that Isaac will never talk. Again, he got to talking much later. Oh, you are so strong. <laughs> and it's uh, too heavy. It's too heavy? And Can you drag it? Can you put, move it on the floor? That's right, good for you. You see how strong you are? You don't have to pick it up, you can drag Obviously, it. Obviously, he can talk, but also he's incredibly intelligent. And if you just watch how he's going to figure out how to push the chair forward, you can see that this child really knows what he's doing, and he's going to have a very bright future. Today's limitations are nothing if he continues doing the work. This is Chaim. He was brought to us at uh, six months of age. Look at his hand, which wasn't the worst part. He got a very severe torticollis and deformity to the back of his head that was unbelievably extreme and couldn't lift his head up when he was on his belly because of the back was scoliotic and, and deformed too. Here he's already looking better. We've been working with him for a while, but we didn't do the DVD at that time. This is after a few months of work where he's able to lift his head, arch his back, and uh, begin turning his head uh, completely equally from side to side. Uh, 
Here I work with him. Uh, Chaim had no movement in his ankles and his feet, and actually his physician thought he might never get that. And here you can look at his right foot and see how spontaneously there's some movement there, quite a lot actually. And here look at his eyes, how much better they look. Both, uh, first of all, are uh, open more equally, but also more focused. His spine and ribcage were so distorted that he was unable to lift his head initially when he was on his belly. And here you can see how beautifully he's moving his wrist and his hand. And, of course, he can start playing with toys. His head goes from side to side freely. I'm still working there because the ribcage and the spine grew so asymmetrically that we need to do something about it. Again, watch here. Joseph is working with um, Chaim. Watch Joseph working real delicately on Chaim's neck and how it gets him to start moving his ankles. And the child likes it. It doesn't bother him. And here, uh, it's a couple, three months ago. Look how beautiful he looks, how he's on all fours now, how much more symmetrical the face is. People wouldn't be able to tell. He was so distorted and so deformed. And look how happy he is and intelligent and growing. And uh, here he's with his rabbi father. And the whole family is doing so much better since he's doing better. This is Gus. He's five days old here. He was uh, referred to us by a pediatrician. He has a pretty severe torticollis. His head is turned to the left, and Marcy is working with him. You'll see he turns the head to the left, and then just a little past, but he doesn't really go to the right. Now, Marcy, as you can see, does not touch the neck, uh, but works on the spine and the rib cage. And really, it's a communication with the nervous system through movement, and the infant, even though he's so little, he's paying attention to what is done with him. And as the current brain research shows, that movement with attention brings enormous changes in the brain very rapidly. Now look at the delicacy. Joseph is working on his ribs here. I'm touching the head a tiny bit. But again, I will not do work on the neck directly, but work on the structures underneath it so that the, because that's, he doesn't have the problem there. And the brain doesn't know him any different. He was born like that. So I'm giving him the experience of being different. And you see very delicately I'm moving the spine in the back. And now here, very gently, once this, the spine and the ribcage can bend uh, in this way symmetrically, I start having the head join it. Now here, look, he, he rolls over. In a minute you'll see, and he does it... Uh, here, Gus is four and a half months old. He had uh, uh, very few lessons, probably not more than 10 or 12. And as you can see, he can only already roll over, but still has a preference to move the head to the left. And what he really is not used to is move his eyes to the right. It's really his brain, his visual cortex has not developed that. So I'm using the toy uh, to have his eyes move to the right, and then he's able to roll over and follow the toy, which is completely new to him. And within a few lessons after this one, he was doing so well that he didn't need any more lessons. This is Nolan. We started working with him when he was three months old. He had the brachial plexus injury to his shoulder. I'm, you're going to see first me, Anat, and then Joseph working with him. But I'd let the mother tell the story. So this is Nolan. So he yeah. was um, born, apparently, not with an official diagnosis of it, but from what I understand, through understanding the injury is a brachial plexus injury in his right shoulder from birth, apparently, at some point. So at birth, he wasn't moving it at all. And... Uh, basically, I was told just to sort of wait six months and see if it, you know, it probably will recover spontaneously. And then at that point, at six months, um, if you still needed to do physical therapy. So I actually decided to do physical therapy with him right away. And it did, and also go to the chiropractor. And it was recovering. And it, you know, was doing well, but definitely still something of concern. And then um, of recent, the physical therapist told me that he would probably have to have surgery 
the sooner the better, that kind of thing. And so that really freaked me out. <laughs> so then I was referred to Anyat, and then that was a few weeks ago, and I ended up getting in here, and he's recovered like almost 100%. So it's been basically a miracle for him. <laughs> <laughs> We continued working with Nolan for a few more sessions, getting his head to come more to the middle. But within a, a short period of time, it became practically impossible, as you can probably see, to tell the difference between his right side, right shoulder, and his left shoulder. And at that point, the mother agreed that we can stop doing the lessons. This is Devora. She's eight weeks old, and she has a pretty severe uh, brachial plexus injury to her left arm, which you don't see at this moment. This is her right good arm, and I am starting to work on the good arm because I want to establish the presence of the pattern of the movement of the arm in the nervous system, in the brain, before I will even, even go to the other side. Here it's about uh, probably seven, eight minutes into the lesson, this is the very first time in her life that she's moving the arm independently. The arm was lying listless the, before, is, that's why you couldn't see it. So with the eight week old, she's already had seven weeks of therapy, in 10 minutes, talking to the brain, so to speak, in an effective way, look, the left arm, she's moving it against gravity, moving it for the first time and moving it against gravity for the first time in her life. So I actually, pretty much finished this lesson in 10 minutes because I figured she cannot do much more change than that. But I just show you a little bit more of this lesson. Now in the beginning of the lesson I kissed her right arm. So here I start kissing her left arm and look she's bringing the arm as far as she can for me to kiss and I will kiss it long before she does it perfectly. Now this is Mary Lee and as you can see she's working on the rib cage uh, in the back of the left arm and on the spine because it's not only the left arm that gets affected, actually the structure, the growth of the bones and the shape of the spine is affected. Now once the, the, there is the representation of the left arm in the brain, which there wasn't there before, that's why all the exercise before didn't help, working directly on the arm is also useful. Here I get her to feel her foot with her left arm, perhaps for the first time, and then simply work on the head because also the development of the tonus of the muscles and the shape of the skull on the left and right side are a little different. Now look, that's her left arm. That's the baby that couldn't move her left arm at all. Now it's very hard to tell the difference. It's only in the rotation of the wrist that it's still a bit different. But once her brain recognized there is a representation in the motor sensory cortex of her arm, this will work. This is Megan. You're seeing a home video of her at about three months old. You see that she does not move the center of herself, very little movement in her arms and legs. Uh, she, her eyes are crossed, but she is very interested in things going on around her. She has gotten uh, some therapy, and her parents have been guided to do some exercises with her. At about 17 months old, Megan discovered the Anat Banyal Method. She came to a free children's clinic and started doing lessons at the Anat Banyal Method Center of San Jose with Andrea Bowers and Alice Luzzi. What you are seeing are some images from the lessons that Megan has received over the last six months. And you see that she's starting to be able to push up, to uh, do a lot of babbling, uh, play with toys, be able to move toward objects and in general just become, come to life and start to uh, be able to be a very good learner. Megan went for one lesson with Anat Baniel and you can see from this first clip that her eyes are still crossed and Anat worked extensively with her intentional looking and uh, being able to uh, target a toy and by the end of the lesson notice how she's looking around obviously seeing and, and viewing things and her eyes are, are tracking beautifully together. Megan continues to receive lessons at the Anat Banyal Method Center of San Jose and she is just doing wonderfully.
This is Lucas. It's not his first lesson. I don't have recorded his first lesson. He uh, was uh, born with a heart defect, had 17 surgeries the first year of his life, and had a stroke during that year. When I got him, uh, Lucas, as CS CCS case manager, warned me in a very friendly way to not expect Lucas to do much in the future. They pretty much have given up on him. He couldn't talk, couldn't sit uh, very well. He certainly couldn't stand. He was terrified most of the time, certainly terrified of movement and cried throughout his lessons. Here you see the progress, it's uh, already a <laughs> way forward, but the, we got this outcome within the first probably two, three months of working with him. And once Lucas started moving, he really took to it. Uh, when you see his face, you can see quite a bit of distortion in the face still from the stroke. Today, which is a few years later, you can barely see any distortion in the face because the movement has become so much more symmetrical. Here, Lucas is able to get up with holding on to the hands of the father. And here, look, it's the very first beginning of Lucas stepping forward by himself. Lucas here has become more and more independent. He's a little over three years old. And initially what he could do is uh, walk with his hands touching the wall. So I, let, I told the mother to do it because that's how his brain figured it out. And I knew that as he does it more and does more variations around it, which is another one of my essentials, he will figure out an independent way of walking, which obviously we can see he's doing here. Lucas' severe traumas from birth on for the first two years of his life has stopped the brain's ability to develop normally. Now he's doing amazingly well. He's talking. He's a regular school. I first saw Hannah over Thanksgiving when the parents came to visit family. She was about six months old. She had a brain lesion and uh, paralysis and spasticity in the left arm and leg. She has had some therapy but still wasn't moving her left arm. Uh, she responded to the lessons extremely fast and um, begin moving her hand and opening it from time to time and start using the arm in relation to toys within a few sessions. Here she starts leaning on the left arm but still prefers to scoot and you can see the, the progress is quite remarkable. It's a few months later and the head is able to be both to the right and the left because when the arm is paralyzed, the head is moved to the other side. And here she's walking on her knees. And as you can see, as far as the crawling is concerned, she's completely taken off. She's able to climb steps. In other words, her nervous system is uh, overcoming the limitations that uh, she had due to the uh, brain lesion. And see how when she walks here, her right arm is very free, she turns right, she turns left, she's very well balanced. In other words, the injury to the brain uh, becomes absorbed by the enormous learning and acquisition of function around it. And of course you can see she's using the left hand more and more, not equally to the right yet, but it's uh, certainly quite remarkable given that it was completely paralyzed and non-existent for her and her brain. You see here the, the right arm actually moved uh, faster uh, still than the left one, but look now, right, left, right, left. That means from the brain's point of view, the arms are becoming more and more equal representation and equal skill. And she's just doing magnificently well. This is Olivia. She had a couple of uh, strokes in utero to the left side of her brain. Uh, she first uh, was brought to an Anadbanil method for children practitioner in Chicago where she resides and had uh, 
extreme uh, spastic paralysis to her right arm and right leg, was unable to crawl or stand or talk. I saw her on the age two for the first time, and here she's a, a bit older than three, and as you can see, can already do a lot more, but still has quite a bit of difficulty shifting weight. When I saw her for the first time, she had enormous amount of fear because she, she had experiences in therapy where they tried to have her do things she was not ready to, and she felt she was falling. Now, as you can see, she can rock her pelvis here, use her lower back, and organize her movement, pushing me with her right hand. She began speaking, by the way, uh, about after three or four lessons when I worked with her first. And now you can see how much more use she has of her right arm. Um, and, of course, it's magnificent to see her being able to begin riding a tricycle. And you can see the right uh, wrist gets a little spastic, but then it gets free again. And uh, here I'm still working with her, with her ability to shift balance. Now she's coming up on the table all by herself. I'm very proud of it. She's sitting tall, and she's able to put her shoes or her uh, flip-flops here on her foot by herself, which is quite remarkable given that we started working with her. She was already two years old and extremely paralyzed. And here you see a happy little girl that's taking dance lessons, doing everything in school, quite magnificent. This is Nora Kate. They come from New York City and they work there with uh, Marcy Lindheimer, a practitioner of uh, Nadbaniel Method in New York. And um, she's about two years old and she can't stand or couldn't stand at this point and uh, certainly couldn't walk. Now what you see me doing here is I realize that there's great limitation in her use of the lower back. That means the configuration, neural patterns of a uh, connection between the head, lower back, hip joints, and feet weren't properly formed. Now you'll see that I very gently start to see if she could side sit because in order to side sit, one side of the lower back has to arch. And she starts crying because, not because of pain, but when she was moved out of her familiar comfort zone, she, she got very upset. So I usually I, I try to get the children not to cry. Certainly pain is not okay for me to have, but look here. She's crying, so that's partly why she's flexed, but she has no idea how to use her lower back. Here we go, a little bit, and then the head goes down, and she starts moving, actually. She starts crawling, which she couldn't do before either, but she has no idea how to lift her head or how to properly arch her back, and before she can do that, she will not be standing up. So I am finding any kind of variation, any kind of opportunity to get her to feel those relationships in her body. Now look here, just uh, within uh, one or two lessons, look already, there's much more activity in the lower back. That means in the brain that the configurations have been formed. And I don't force, I don't press. But you see, gently I can feel that her back can move, but she just doesn't know how to link the back to the leg. And oops, here she did it. And she's, it's unfamiliar, so she's kind of like, not sure she's liking it, but it's a lot better. And now you see her head is up. And the reason the head is up, because all of a sudden she has a sense how to use her, her lower back. Now, see, she arched her back as usual, and oops, she got herself completely upright. Nora Kate, by the way, by now can walk independently. I don't have the videos because it was done in New York. This is Marcy holding Jack. We don't have the video of his uh, very first week of lessons with me. He was uh, diagnosed as autistic, uh, just a little over a year old. He never interacted or hugged his mother, had no receptive language, could walk, and uh, manipulated objects quite well. 
Here, it's the second visit. By this time, Jack already had receptive language. Um, and I realized early on that even though he could move, uh, his back and lower back and movement were very undifferentiated. Here you can see he's already interacting with his mother. He came to California to see me from New York uh, for five days every three um, months, and then in between so months, Marcy for two or three lessons per week. Jack improved uh, dramatically in his language capacities, intellectual capacities, and motor capacities, and became very, very social. Yet at this stage, if he didn't get lessons for more than two weeks, he began regressing. So we made sure he keeps getting continuous lessons for approximately two years. Okay, you did well. Yes, oh. you did very well. <laughs> well he yes. works. Yes. My dad did all works. I, next time, I don't want the next dad. He you works. Know. And I was one time, I just had a big, big Today, Jack is mainstreamed in first grade. He's doing socially very well. He no longer falls apart. Uh, in loud, crowded spaces. His disability was downgraded from autism to attention deficit disorder, which I don't think he has anymore either. And we just spoke with the mother, and apparently he's facing now some learning challenges and should be coming back to get some lessons to help him with that. An important part of our success with Jack was that we got him at such a young age. When I get children with autism past age nine, there is not very much that we can do for them. This is Daniel. He is an autistic child. Again, we don't have the initial s series of lessons on video, but he was crying and crying and um, drooling and holding on to a toy and very concave and into himself. Here he's already moving much better, but look here he does these typical autistic hand movements. And you see in a moment I will do something with his arm that will give him an alternative a, a access to the hand and actually feel the hand because when he does the movements, those automatic movements, he has no idea. Look, he's listening to himself and I was trying to do it himself. So I, he's very happy with it. And now here, he completely participates. He's actually laughing and feels how he can lift his, arch his back and lift his tush off the floor, which will give him more, that's right, that's control over his, not just his legs, but actually his arms. So see, his arms are very quiet now. And most importantly, he's attentive to himself. This is a child that cried all the time, had no idea what's happening to him or around him. And look at the quality of his movement and his joy and his participation. At this moment, this autistic child is not autistic at all. He's playing with me. He's responding to my instructions to throw a toy. And look here. He's learning how to feed himself. Those big, there were big issues with feeding. And again, me just guiding him a little bit and suggesting he's very aware of what he's doing. He's no longer uh, out to another world. This is Julia. Here she's about five years old. I saw her first when she was two quite severe case of autism. She had enormous amount of fears like uh, phobias from tassels and other things and it was impossible to turn her over and I realized uh, quickly that she had real issues with processing information coming from her vestibular system. So I focused on that a lot but I don't have any videos of that uh, from those lessons. She also had no I. She couldn't say, I want, or that's me. She would say, 
Julia wants chocolate. She would talk as if somebody was asking her a question. Now, within the first uh, series of lessons, she started getting her first I and me. And here you see that's a child that I can give her instructions and have her feel what she's doing or not doing with her lower back and how to use it. We've had a, quite a big stop between now and about a year earlier because the mother had another baby and they come from the Midwest. Now here I'm telling her to round her back and feel what she's doing and then I'm telling her to arch her back so she would feel how to get tall. Thank you, honey. You did really well. Yes, you are. Julia made remarkable strides. And as you can see here, she's not only listening to me, she's also listening to herself. Now, she still had issues. She was not like 100% a normal child, but she was able to function fully in school and did much better.